fascist committee. So what did Stalin do? <laughs> he had them all arrested. <laughs> and he even returned the German communists, you know, to Hitler that were seeking refuge in the Soviet Union. But, but if you look at Stalin, Stalin was the ultimate, probably the greatest leader the Russians ever had. And he wasn't even Russian, he was Georgian. Because never in the history of Russia has Russia had influence right up to the Alb River, right up to the right up to Slesvig Holstein. Yeah, yeah, but that wasn't a Stalin, that was the Red Army. <laughs> no, that was Stalin. Who, uh, Stalin was a cool, collected guy. When the, when the Germans were, uh, were winning, Stalin just said, who was the, uh, who was the one, the officer in charge? He said, make sure he is eliminated for good, you know what I mean. And uh, the best, the worst thing to be in Russia was to be a general until 1941. The best thing yeah. was to be a colonel like Zhukov. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But Stalin was never lost his cool. Yeah, I mean, he could have dominated he, the world. He, he was not well educated. He was educated as a clergyman. He was a smart guy. Yeah, 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 he was a smart guy. But he was only educated as a clergyman. He could have had everything in Europe. He could have had all of Germany. Yeah. He could have, but he thought he went too fast because he said even Churchill and Truman, are, he said even Truman is not that dumb. But they were dumb because yeah. they all admired Stalin. Yeah. You know, sometimes you gotta, you know, when he did the Berlin Volcade, that's what started the... the, the yeah, the but the Jewish Bundesleaders, Ehrlich and Alter, they died in his prison. So I don't forgive him for that, for sure. Well... And that, you know, were not loyal to him. and then the whole history of the Jewish Bund is so rich, you know, in ideas, and it's not even taught they, they were, in the they Jewish were, schools here they were, now. They were not loyal to Stalin, but because That's Stalin, right. when he made his non-aggression pact with Hitler, they, they went against him. That's right. They should have. That pact was no good. It was false. You know, well, it got only allowed Germany to arm itself. It got in Poland. Yeah. Well, who wants to, you know, like they did the same thing. They divided Poland between them, just like Israel and Jordan divided up Palestine and between and he, them. Well, anyway, okay, I'll be here next week. Get warm. He doesn't get cold very much. He's too chubby. <laughs> so, yeah. So I do this as a Jewish protest, you know, inside the Jewish community, you know, because... Like the latest information is that 50% of Jewish Americans are opposed, you know, want a ceasefire, but the other 50% don't. So we have to convince them, you know, not by scaring them, but by logic. Yeah. Ah, very good. Yeah. So I'm rebuilding the Jewish Bund, you know, I not. It's the Jewish movement, the, the Jewish socialist movement that was anti-fascist. So the Zionists, they wanted to run away, you know, into a corner and set up a state, right? But the Jewish Bund, they said, they didn't, they were opposed to fascism. They said the way to defeat fascism is here, you know, in the, in the countries in which we live, you know, like, like this is, you know, okay, let's say this is Canada. You know, because there's fascists, you know, here like that Nazi that was hosted in the parliament, does that mean that we're supposed to run away to Israel and hide? No. No, we defeat the fascism here before it grows. Yeah. Oh my, so... I don't know, I think it's about 50-50 here as well in the Jewish community now, from the reactions that I've been seeing. Oh, they won't allow me into the building here. If I go inside there, they arrest me. <laughs> They're very upset. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very, like, I don't know, Anthony Housefather being our MP. Yeah. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't do anything. Yeah. He was, he's been so vocal. Yeah. I should run against him. <laughs> yeah, I would vote for you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, there's so little for me to do here, you know, like I'm a doctor of political science, but I can't get any teaching here. I don't get any respect here. So I was thinking, you know, after I get my knees fixed up at the hospital, getting my knees replaced, <laughs> I'm going to go to Palestine and work there. Yeah. yeah. I've been there before, yeah. of course, since 2003 when Rachel Corey was crushed by a bulldozer. I went there for two weeks and then I went back there. She was a um, Jewish. Uh, she was an American activist who was trying to stop a bulldozer from 
from destroying a house near Rafa. And she stood in front of the bulldozer, and the bulldozer crushed her. You know, yeah. And then, and then an, another volunteer was was killed in Rafa that summer as well, who was a friend of mine because I worked with him in Nablus in the northern uh, West Bank. And after two weeks, you know, he was he went to Rafa, and I said to him, Rafa, that's dangerous. And he says, I know. He went there and he was shot in the head by a sniper. You know, if we if they're allowed to, they will go fascist. They are fascist. They're, yeah, they're already fascist. Yeah. Why them into uh, the Sinai, Egypt. No, the Egypt will not allow them to come in. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Yeah. So, okay, so they realize now that the Palestinians are not going to be allowed into Egypt. So I heard a politician, an Israeli politician the other day, <coughs> propose that uh, Hamas should leave, go to, go to Egypt in exile, all the fighters, and then uh, leave the Palestinian population to be well treated by Israel. <laughs> but this was tried once before. In 1982 in Lebanon, Israel came in there, occupied Beirut, and uh, the PLO was there, you know, with Yasser Arafat. And they were, and they were told, okay, you, the fighters should leave and we'll protect the Palestinian refugees. Yeah. Two weeks afterwards, 3,000 Palestinian refugees were slaughtered in, in, in Sabra Shatila, in the two refugee camps in Beirut, even though the United States of America was their guarantor. They killed how? Well, the uh, local fascist organization called Phalanges were, were armed, yeah. and they were allowed into the refugee camps, and they were killing people with, with knives to be quiet all day, all night. And they were surrounded by Israel, and Israel was watching them do it. I, and I wrote, documented it all in my first book on Sabra Shatila, and then my book is in the library here. Is it? Yeah. Oh my God, that's so cool. I have four books in the library here. My I've thesis. I've never been in the building, and I literally live in that. Okay, so oh. Right uh, no, the library here is open. Yeah. And my books are there, you know, you, you just have to. Where are my cards? I changed the pocket. Maybe they're in the back here. Yeah. Oh yeah, I found them. But I just don't know, like, at this point, we're, what, two generations of settling in, in Palestine? Two generations of, of what? Of settlers in Palestine. Thank you. Yes. That's my thesis, and my most recent book is the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations. So there would be two nations in the country, each would be autonomous, but one wouldn't be above the other. But the, you know, it doesn't work within a nation-state format. There has to be a constitutional uh, That's the thing. process. That's what the nation state means, yeah. So it's 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 an ancient thing proposed by the philosopher German philosopher Hegel in 1648. And it doesn't work, you know, yeah. <laughs> especially in the Orient, you know, where there's more nations in yeah. every country than than you would, you know, be able to count. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for encouraging me. Yeah. Okay. I will. Okay. I'll be here next Sunday, no problem. Every Sunday. From yeah. what time? From, well now from 2 until 5. Yeah.
okay goodbye